I would like to welcome all of you into worship this morning by saying Happy New Year. This is, yes, this is the first day of the Christian New Year. The Christian year begins with the first Sunday of Advent, and so we begin a new journey together. So welcome to the first Sunday of Advent. We are celebrating this year with the color blue. Uh, blue and purple are traditional colors to celebrate Advent, and we decided uh, to try blue this year, and a big thanks to Hannah Fletcher Page for sewing our vestments, and to Sally Honor and Judy Lur for their consultation um, in helping to add to the visual experience of Advent this morning. I'd like to say a special word of welcome to all of you who are visiting with us this morning. Um, uh, we have a very special guest this morning. Bishop Pete Torrio is with us this morning from the Philippines, and we are so glad that you are here, and we hope that you feel welcomed in this place this morning. And there he is. Thank you. Let's give him a warm welcome. If you are visiting with us and happen to be from Nashville and are looking for a place to call a church home, we would love to get to know you a little bit. And if you would sign the registration pads that all of us are invited to sign this morning and share with us an email address or a mailing address, then that will give us an opportunity to reach out to you and let you know some of the ways we're trying to live the light of Christ in our community and in our world. If you are a college student, our college students gather for lunch every Sunday after the 11 o'clock service when school is in session. So they'll be meeting at noon just outside this doorway in Reed Hall to go to lunch together. There are lots of things happening during the season of Advent, opportunities to worship and to serve. And I want to highlight a few things that are happening today. Uh, this morning, hopefully, you've seen our mission market is happening in Reed Hall, and that will take place throughout the Sundays of Advent, an opportunity to buy some gifts that do good in the world and also uh, are very touching for folks that we have on our gift list. We have also upstairs in the fourth story theater a display of nativity scenes uh, from members of our congregation. And I would invite you, uh, if you have a little time on Sunday mornings, to take a contemplative walk through those displays and ponder how the story of the, the nativity is told throughout the world. This afternoon at 3.30 downstairs in McCorder Hall, we have our Advent wreath-making workshop. And then at 4.30, our chancel choir will lead us in a service of music and worship. There is dinner that will start being served at 5 and will go until after the concert. So you can attend all of these things and also have dinner. Um, just mix and match however you would like to do that to begin this season. Finally, if you have picked a gift uh, to give to one of the foster children in our city, Stacy wanted me to let you know that those gifts are due on December 6th here in Reed Hall. We have some bins over to the side. You can see because there are bicycles out there. So uh, thank you so much for participating in that. As the season of Advent begins, I invite all of us to enjoy the silence and the holiness of this space. In a world that is very busy and noisy around us, may we be grounded in the silence, in the waiting, in the hope of worship.
Watch and pray for the grace of God. There will be signs in the heavens and on the earth. The kingdom of God is near. Christ is coming with power and glory. May our worship prepare us for the promised time. Please be seated. We light this first candle of our Advent wreath as a sign of hope for the coming of Christ into our world. Hear these words from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As a, recon as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us exchange signs of reconciliation and love. The peace of Christ be with you.
Please join me in the Advent prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. I invite you to listen to this lesson from the Gospel of Luke. Del Evangelio de San Lucas, escuchen la lectura. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then Jesus told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. La palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. The word of God for the people of God. Gracias damos a Dios. I'm not, I'm not telling you something you don't know when I say that waiting is hard. It is not easy for us human beings to wait. Whether we're waiting for something good or we're waiting for something difficult, the waiting is the hardest part. Whether we're waiting for a package to arrive on our front step or waiting for a loved one to step off the airplane, or waiting to find out if we've gotten into that college or gotten that dream job, or whether we're waiting for the doctor's phone call to find out the results of the tests, or waiting to find out if our position is on the list to be eliminated at the end of the year, or waiting to see if perhaps Reconciliation is possible in our most important relationship. Waiting is really hard. It's hard for us human beings because it's a reminder that we're not in control. Sometimes we have to wait for other people, for circumstances, or simply for time to pass. It's a reminder that there are some things we cannot fix, we cannot hurry, we cannot make happen no matter how hard we try. Sometimes we just have to wait. And it's especially hard in our 21st century culture. We live in a culture of immediate gratification. All of our technology is designed to shorten our waiting times, to make things happen more quickly and more quickly. We know how it is. 
But just the other day, I had an idea of something I wanted to give David for a Christmas present. All I had to do was open up my iPad, get to the website, click, click, click. Two days later, it's on the doorstep. Now my waiting is done. I can check that off my list, but David has to wait four weeks to find out what it is. But it's, it's that easy. And that's the kind of culture we live in. It's fast, it's convenient. We just don't like to wait. And we see it especially this time of year all around us, the hurry and the scurry and the noise. And yet here we are, the people of God, the disciples of Jesus Christ, and we have made the decision on purpose to show up in this place for four weeks and wait. This is a sacred waiting room, and together we gather with the people of God to wait. So what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for in the season of Advent? Well, someone will say, that's easy. We're waiting for Christmas. Yes, indeed, we are. We are preparing to hear once again that beautiful, powerful story of Jesus' birth. We're doing everything we can to get ready to hear that good news again, that God became flesh and lived among us. That God was born into this world as a poor, vulnerable baby in the backwaters of Israel to poor migrant parents who weren't even married yet. What a great mystery that is. And we need time to get ready to hear it again. But that's not all we're waiting for. We are also waiting for something more. Were you a little struck by the gospel reading this morning? <clears throat> Did it seem a little bit out of place in this Christmas season? Well, if we follow the lectionary, on the first Sunday of Advent every year, we get a text just like that one from either Mark, Matthew, or Luke. It's an apocalyptic text in which Jesus is saying to his disciples, the day is coming. Be ready for that day when the Son of Man returns. So we're not just waiting for the birth of Jesus. We are waiting for the return of Christ, the second coming. Now, I know we get a little uneasy talking about the second coming because we, we don't want to be like those people who put out, you know, the billboard, May 21st, the end of the world, the end is near. That's not our theology. That's not what we do. But it is important for us to remember these words of Jesus and this urgency that the first century Christians felt that Jesus was coming back, that that day was coming. And we, as the people of God, are to look for that day. That day when all of creation is made new that day when the kingdom of God is fulfilled in our midst, in all its beauty and perfection. If you want to know what we're waiting for, open your ears to listen to the communion liturgy this morning. We are waiting for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We are waiting for that day when nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn or teach or practice war anymore. We are waiting for that day when the hungry shall be fed and the poor shall be lifted up. The day when Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. As one theologian has said, we Christians today are living in the in-between times, in between Christ's birth and Christ's return, in between the now and the not yet. So how do we live in this time? How do we wait? <clears throat> well, Jesus said to his disciples, the day is coming, but as for you, stand up 
and raise your heads, for your redemption is near. Be alert. Keep your eyes open for signs of the inbreaking of God's kingdom that are happening here and now among us. Notice the little buds on the fig tree and all the trees, signs of life and resurrection in our midst. Wake up, Jesus said, to signs of the kingdom. So we keep alert, we keep our eyes open for all of the signs of love and peace and justice unfolding before us, the kingdom breaking in. In other words, we live in hope. But I know, I know how it is. At least for me, it is at times hard to have hope when the worries of this world weigh me down, when the darkness seems to cover me. I've been living through a season these past few weeks of, of worry and heaviness. I have four dear friends right now, three of them younger than I, who are battling cancer. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right, and I don't know what the hope is for healing. Or I look at the headlines and I listen to our discourse and our rhetoric and I think we're moving backwards, not forwards. And I worry about our church, our denomination, and all of these things happening around us. And I sometimes think I've lost hope. But then last week, I participated in a memorial service for a friend of mine. She was 68 years old and died of ALS. And we as a congregation have loved ones we have lost to that terrible and tragic disease. When she first got diagnosed, we knew that she was on a journey toward death. And that journey would only increase in pain and disability. But she never ceased to be a person of hope. And when we got together to plan her service, we found some instructions she had left. We weren't surprised to find that she had left us instructions. First thing she wanted was her service to be on Sunday, because Sunday is the day of resurrection. It's the Lord's day. The second thing she wanted was for no one to wear black. She wanted everybody to wear their most colorful outfits as a sign of the beauty and joy of the kingdom of God. And she wanted somebody to sing an old gospel song. It's an Easter song, really. Because he lives. Anybody know that song? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And I'm hearing my friend in this song. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know that God holds the future. Life is worth living because he lives. That is hope, my brothers and sisters. Hope that goes beyond the disease of ALS. Hope that goes beyond the troubles of this life. Hope that is rooted in the life and resurrection of Christ. And it is that hope that defines how we live. We live as if the kingdom of God is already realized. We work to lift up the poor. We, wor we work in this world to show love to our neighbors and work for peace and justice. We got a lot of work to do. So my friends, let us be people of hope. For Christ is coming and that is good news. As we come to a time of prayer, we lift up the joys and concerns of our congregation as an offering to our loving God. 
And if you have prayer requests that you would like to share this morning, you may fill out one of the gray cards that's located in the pew racks in front of you. Please indicate if you would like your prayer request to be shared or if it should remain confidential. And you may place those cards in the offering plates in a few moments as they make their way down the pews. You may have noticed we have three roses on our re table today, which means we have three births to announce. The first, we celebrate the birth of Vera Hall, who was born November 5th to Randy and Walton Hall. She is welcomed also by her big brothers, William and Wiley Hall, and grandmother, Beth Creighton. We also celebrate the birth of Charles Robert Kuhlman, Charlie, who was born November 15th in Washington, D.C., to Rob and Katie Bowers Kuhlman. He is welcomed also by his grandparents, Greg and Nan Bowers, Aunt Amy Bowers Myers, and her family, Cameron, Clyde, and Lofton Myers. And then also we celebrate the birth of Sylvia Grace Fields, who was born November 25th to Parker Bibb and Aaron Fields. And she is welcomed also by her grandparents, Ellen Bibb and Jason Guthrie. And now let us enter a time of prayer. Holy God, we wait in this divine silence. We watch and we listen for the smallest signs and the faintest murmurs that might help us sense your coming presence. We enter this season of waiting with a great sense of anticipation. We expect your arrival among us, and it is this hope that enlivens us this day. We admit that we often find it difficult to keep such radical trust in you and the promise of your coming to dwell among us. We are often all consumed by the hardships and stark realities of this world. We lament humanity's seemingly endless ability to turn away from you. We mourn the hurt and suffering that afflict so many lives. And we are consumed by anxiety and worry that threatens to overwhelm us. Help us to throw off the weights that hold us down, those things that keep us from joyfully responding to your impending arrival. We pray that fear will be overcome by your assurance, that pain will be overcome by your healing, and that hatred will be overcome by your overwhelming love. Remind us that those who faithfully seek your appearance will be met by your world-transforming power and glory. Empower us to believe that such goodness truly can change the world around us. Embolden us to expect that the gift of your gracious presence in the lives of the people of this world can lead us to a new way of being. Reassure us that such divine encounter is possible in each of our lives that our hurts might be healed, that our relationships might be mended, and that our lives might be caught up in the abundant gratitude for your good gifts. In this holy silence, we pray all these things. Come to us, O God. Amen. As followers of a giving God, may we give our tithes and offerings to God's glory.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. be seated. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you. Then he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as together we sing the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, when we gather at the table, we experience the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. For all are welcome at this table. If this is your first time to receive communion in this congregation, it's important for you to know that this is an open table and all who are here are welcome. No matter your age, no matter your experience, you have a place at this table. We'll be guided by our ushers as we come forward. Our choir will be served first, followed by our friends in the balcony and then those in the transepts and then all of us in the center. We come and kneel at the altar rails and if you would have your hands open, that will allow our servers to know that you have yet to be served. We'll have a pair that's standing just in front of the lectern that will have gluten-free bread. So as you kneel, if you need gluten-free, if you would just let them know. Maggie and I will be making our way around the sanctuary. If there are some who are not able to come forward, we will serve you where you are. We always have an opportunity to give a second mile gift on Communion Sundays, to give to one of our partners in ministry here. And I want to ask Nancy to tell us um, what our communion offering is for today. As many of you know, I am a pastor here, but I'm also the pastor across the street at the Vanderbilt Wesley Fellowship. Today's December communion offering is for our Wesley Foundations in Nashville. This will go to Belmont's Wesley, Vandy's, TSU's, and Fisk Wesley. These communities provide a space for, for students to build authentic Christian community, find places of belonging, practice spiritual practices, worship together, grow deeper in their faith, and then reach out to their campuses, Nashville and beyond, in service. Thank you for your generosity. I want to invite you, as we prepare to come to the table, to use the silence and the waiting time for holy, prayerful waiting. If you find yourself sitting in your pew as others are coming forward for communion, if there's something in your life that you're waiting on from God, take that time to offer it to God and to place your trust and your hope in the God who is coming to us.
invite you now to stand as you're able and join with me in giving thanks for what we have received. You have given yourself to us, Lord. Your love has made us a new people. Your glory has filled our hearts. Now may we go from this sacred waiting room into the world that God loves and God created. May we go in hope, in action, and in the sure assurance of Christ's coming again.